100 years ago today, the Chinese Communist Party was born. At first small and on the fringes of society, the group evolved into one of the most powerful, ambitious political entities the modern world has seen. China's push to create a new world order has seen President Xi Jinping crack down on domestic dissent, while also look abroad to expand his nation's influence. And the two areas long in his scope? Hong Kong and Taiwan. The discussion around their autonomy has sparked massive protests for years. And at the center of these tensions are young people. I'm Gustavo Ariano. You're listening to The Times, daily news from the LA Times. Today is July 1st, 2021. Former U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld dies at 88. Bill Cosby is released from prison after his sexual assault conviction is overturned. And in totally unrelated news, a foul-smelling corpse flower is about to bloom at the Huntington Library, Art Museum, and Botanical Gardens right here in SoCal. Today, we start a two-part series on the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions. We get into the continued crackdown on freedom and democracy in Hong Kong today, and China's growing threats to absorb Taiwan tomorrow. And in both episodes, we highlight the lives uprooted because of it. Two years ago, the world watched as millions of people in Hong Kong marched on the streets to call for autonomy from China. Beijing responded by passing a national security law last summer that broadly defined acts of subversion, foreign collusion, and terrorism that critics say crushed civil liberties. Since the law was enacted in 2020, authorities have arrested thousands of pro-democracy activists and shut down a major daily newspaper. Many people have fled Hong Kong, some to neighboring Taiwan. Yet Taiwan, a self-governing island that China claims as its own territory, is at risk as well. My colleague David Pearson covers this region for The Times. David, welcome to The Times. Hey, thank you for having me. The big news this past week was the permanent closure of Apple Daily. It was one of the largest newspapers in Hong Kong and long critical of China's crackdown on liberties in the former British colony. What happened? Yeah, the Apple Daily was a tabloid newspaper at the center of the democracy movement in Hong Kong. And it's had this unique place in the city for quite some time. It stormed onto the scene in 1995 as sort of this gossipy newspaper. Some questionable stories early on, admittedly, you know, it it sort of veered towards salacious news. But the difference was it was owned by a brash apparel magnate by the name of Jimmy Lai, who was deeply moved by the June 4th massacre of pro-democracy students in Beijing in 1989. So he has always been someone who has favored more democracy in Hong Kong, and he's used his newspaper to be a thorn on the side of the governments in Hong Kong and Beijing. The Hong Kong situation is getting tense here, but we have to go on. Hong Kong police have arrested media tycoon Jimmy Lai and raided the publisher's headquarters. The 71-year-old is an outspoken pro-democracy figure in Hong Kong who regularly criticizes China's authoritarian rule and Hong Kong's government. Jimmy Lai has been jailed since December. He was one of the first dominoes to fall in Hong Kong and China's crackdown on democracy. Lai was taken out of his mansion in Kowloon by police and later brought to his media company, Next Digital, where a police raid was ongoing, according to a live stream video by staff. Lai remained in the offices for over two hours before police took him away. So as Hong Kong became more restive over the years, China and the Hong Kong government wouldn't abide by this newspaper that was sort of nipping at the government and promoting more freedom and democracy and aiding the protesters in their editorial stance. And so they did something unprecedented in Hong Kong history. They launched a campaign to take this newspaper down. And what they did was starting on June 17th, they arrested top editors, they froze assets of the company worth about $2.3 million. 
And they accused it of conspiring with foreign countries by publishing editorials calling for sanctions on China and Hong Kong. This uh, essentially just seized the paper up. They couldn't pay their reporters. They couldn't pay their staff. Finally, they had to announce their closure on June 24th. And their website went dark. And, you know, I think they printed a, a million final copies. People lined up in the middle of the night to try and get the last copy because it was, you know, one of the last acts of defiance left in the city that had essentially outlawed dissent. But they'd wiped out 26 years of, of collective memory. Several dozen staff from Apple Daily came out around midnight to thank their supporters after printing a million copies of its final edition. Staff members, including reporters, thanked their supporters before bowing. And supporters, in turn, expressed their gratitude towards the pro-democracy newspaper's 26-year run. We'll be back right after this break. So, David, you just told us a story about the folding of the pro-democracy newspaper, Apple Daily. How did the Hong Kong government have the power to ultimately pressure a publication to fold? President Xi Jinping had warned earlier that he would not allow any challenge to Beijing's authority. And uh, given his more hardline stance, he introduced a new national security law, which superseded all the laws in Hong Kong and its own constitution, which gave the authorities broad powers to imprison people, you know, up to the life in prison sentences for any form of dissent, essentially. And almost overnight, many of these freedoms that people have been accustomed to was taken away. A man is intercepted after police had issued warnings to a crowd that they might be in violation of the national security law, which has just taken effect. The law makes what China calls secessionist, subversive or terrorist activities illegal as well as foreign intervention in the city's internal affairs. Meanwhile, a senior Chinese official in charge of Hong Kong affairs says the rule is necessary to correct the deviation in the understanding of the one country, two systems in Hong Kong. This law earned immediate worldwide attention and condemnation, and the Chinese government continued like it hadn't done anything wrong. But David, remind us how it got to that point. To understand what happened in 2019, you actually have to go back. Hong Kong was a former British colony, and it was returned to China in 1997. The first 500-plus Chinese troops have already rolled across the border into Hong Kong. Cameras on them, they sat silently in their buses as they began to move, three hours before the official moment, handing the territory over from British to Chinese control. At a farewell ceremony, outgoing Governor Chris Patton predicted even under a new administration, Hong Kong star will continue to rise. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. That is the promise, and that is the unshakable destiny. Part of that handover agreement meant that Hong Kong get to ke- sort of keep its way of life for 50 years. That meant a lot of the freedoms that we're sort of used to in the West, like freedom of press, freedom of assembly. They called this one country, two systems. But what happened after 1997 is that China wanted to assert its influence, and it did not like the fact that they had this international city with foreign influence right on its doorstep. It saw it as sort of a risk. And the more that Hong Kong people call for democracy, the more Beijing wanted to tighten controls on the city. So what we saw were a series of protests, the first big one called the Umbrella Protest in 2014, where people occupied the central business district, calling for China to make 
good on its promise to let Hong Kongers choose their own leaders. I'm here today with uh, the yellow umbrella because it stands uh, against the shooting of tear gas at the children of Hong Kong. I guess for me, the, the umbrellas are the kind of striking thing. People are calling it the uh, umbrella revolution or the umbrella movement. It's a good symbol of the nonviolent method of their protest. The umbrella uh, is the weapon of choice by the protesters against uh, the pepper sprays by police and then also later uh, tear gas by the police. Finally, in 2019, Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, she introduced something called the extradition bill, which would have allowed, or at least many people feared it would have allowed, Hong Kongers to be uh, taken to mainland China, where they would have been subject to the arbitrary laws of a court system ruled by the Communist Party rather than the you know, British common law system in Hong Kong. They saw this as the firewall coming down between Hong Kong and China. Thousands of protesters have blocked entry to Hong Kong's government center, delaying a legislative session on a proposed extradition bill. People poured out on the streets. So on one day on June, there was an estimated 2 million people that came out to protest against this extradition bill. This was mostly a leaderless protest that was organic. It was uh, largely organized online on encrypted apps. And, you know, one of the tenets of the movement was to be like water, uh, which was to sort of adapt and ebb and flow depending on how authorities came at them. <laughs> Many of the protesters out on the streets were young, like Daniel, were using a pseudonym because he's afraid of retaliation. The first day of the protest, I come out on the street with my friends, with my brothers to protest, try to change something again. Because, you know, after the umbrella movement, we try hard to change, but we still get nothing. The people we put inside the election council have been disqualified. Nothing changed. Daniel was like many young protesters in Hong Kong who didn't consider themselves or see themselves as Chinese. They saw themselves as either Hong Kongers or Hong Kong Chinese. It's a, a distinct identity. People in Hong Kong speak Cantonese rather than Mandarin. They wanted to preserve that identity. They were out on the streets protesting, but they called themselves frontliners. These were the people with the helmets and the goggles facing the brunt of the police crackdown. What makes us go to the front line is want to change. Peaceful protests actually do nothing. So we need to take a further step to show what we want. So we would try to storm in. Some people behind us they're towing other peaceful protesters to support us because the frontliner is ready to sacrifice themselves just to take a further step for Hong Kong. So we should all join them, support them. Daniel is one of the protesters who broke into the Legislative Council in early July. The Legislative Council or LegCo is kind of like Hong Kong's Congress or Parliament. On July 1st, 2019, at 9 p.m., hundreds of protesters like him broke in and they swarmed the chamber and started sort of defacing everything in there. The protesters overflowed onto a major downtown road as they overturned barriers and tussled with police outside the building that also houses the chambers where lawmakers discuss the bill. Protesters broke windows and then pried open metal gates to force their way into the chambers. Police were inside, but they appeared to have backed off as the protesters came in. It looks like they wanted to avoid a confrontation. They ransacked the cabinets. They graffitied on the walls. You try to hang on the wall, like, to cover the logo of the CCP. 
we are taking back our religious council. It's for the people, not for the pro Beijing. By vandalizing the legislature, the authorities can now sort of paint the protesters as, as lawless and, and dangerous. And, you know, this helped alienate a lot of the older generation in favor of the government. But the young protesters, you know, they, they felt like they had no choice. They had tried to change Hong Kong to win more democracy through the proper channels. None of it worked. And there was a, a slogan spray painted inside the legislature that kind of summed it up perfectly where someone wrote, it was you who taught me peaceful marches did not work. Finally, late into the night, the Hong Kong police used tear gas and they were able to disperse the protesters, push them out of the building. And Daniel, who ran out, was caught in this chaos. I almost have been arrested because, you know, I'm shot and lie on the ground and someone pull me up and carry me away. I can see nothing inside the gas, and <laughs> it's so painful. I remember that moment, my boyfriend in Hong Kong, they get lost in the tear gas. Luckily, someone find him and bring us all to the, my home. Nine days later, Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong, declared the extradition bill dead. I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise, restart our communication with all sectors of society, do more explanation work, and listen to different views of society. So it felt like a victory for the protesters, but really a lot of them were still in danger of arrest, like Daniel. He made the mistake of showing his face during a interview and immediately his friends in the protest movement told him that he was probably going to be targeted by police. You need to leave Hong Kong because maybe police will try to arrest you. You do a lot of dangerous stuff, yeah. So in mid-July, Daniel made the decision to leave Hong Kong for Taiwan. It was a sudden decision and he, he didn't even really have a lot of time to pack. I try to bring more and more, but you know, the time is doesn't enough. All my stuff actually are still in Hong Kong. I bring a very few stuff, my personal belonging, clothes, some electronic stuff, like computer, and that's it. His mom and his boyfriend, they saw him off at the airport, but his mom actually didn't know the real reason he was leaving. She just thought he was going to Taiwan to study. And Daniel says that night was really emotional for him. When the paint took off and I look at the wheels outside the window, I told myself maybe I can't saw the same view for my entire life. The day CCP still exists, I can't go back here. I can't go back to Hong Kong and definitely I can't go to mainland China. And all your parents, grandpa, grandma, I can't saw them for their last moment. After this break, Daniel lands at another place China wants to take over, Taiwan. So David, you were telling us the story of Daniel, a 22-year-old Hong Kong student who participated in the 2019 protests. After breaking into Hong Kong's parliament, he then flees to Taiwan. What happened next? Yeah, so he was getting a lot of advice from friends telling him that he had to get out of Hong Kong for his safety. And he tapped into a network of people who were helping exiles or activists and dissidents get to Taiwan. So he flies to Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, and shows up at the airport, has no idea who he's supposed to meet. He waits there, and sure enough, a nonprofit group comes up and picks him up and gives him a place to live. And eventually, he enrolls in a university there, and he decides he no longer wants to study chemistry because of the experiences the last two years, and starts studying political science. 
So he has this new life, but he's still suffering from PTSD and he'll often wake up in the middle of the night and have nightmares about being in the protests. He's staying up late and rarely sleeping because he's watching live streams of the protests in Hong Kong from Taiwan. We keep looking at the scene, but we can't do anything. And feeling guilty day by day, like every single time there are protests happening in Hong Kong, we open the live window immediately to see what happens. Since we live in Hong Kong, we can't, do, we can't fight in the front line and we try to report it on Telegram, something like that. Just try to do the things we can do, but you know, you want to walk to them, we want to f protect them, but you know, there's a wall, there's a gap, and you can't do nothing. You can do nothing. Does Daniel have any regrets? He really has no regrets uh, about what he did. He, he feels like he had no choice but to join the protest movement for Hong Kong's future. If you give me a chance to redo all the stuff, I won't change a bit. I won't change anything. I will still go to the front line to protect others. Or maybe the only thing I would change is I won't leave Hong Kong. Daniel's not the only Hong Konger who has fled to Taiwan in recent years, right? I, I know the Chinese government has long threatened to take over the self-governing island. So what is it about Taiwan that makes it appealing to these fleeing activists from Hong Kong? Taiwan is considered safe ground because the territory is China's like geopolitical foe. And, you know, the two sides have been at odds with each other since 1949. After the Chinese Civil War, the former Chinese national government fled to Taiwan as the communist Chinese took over mainland China. And, you know, there've been tensions between the two sides for 70 years, but no war. Taiwan has sort of embraced the West. It's an unofficial ally of the U.S. to become this thriving democracy, this economic powerhouse. You know, when you think of Taiwan, you should think of microchips because, you know, and those are the things that go in our iPhones and Teslas. It all comes from Taiwan. It's culturally progressive. It's the only place in Asia that allows same-sex marriage. So there's a lot of ties with Taiwan to the West. And because it's considered the last beacon of hope for Chinese democracy, these exiles sort of see it as the only place they can go safely in Asia. Yeah, Taiwan is not globally recognized as a country, although its government is completely autonomous. Athletes can't compete in global competitions like the Olympics under the name Taiwan. Taiwan isn't part of the World Health Organization. And Beijing seems to just get more and more belligerent about what it says it wants to do to Taiwan every year. It wasn't always that way. China had a policy they called peaceful reunification, where they tried to lure Taiwan with economic benefits, but they also isolated Taiwan diplomatically. And the more China pushed, the more Taiwan recoiled. And it's much the same way with people in Hong Kong. They didn't want to live under an authoritarian government. And so what's happened is under the hardline regime of President Xi Jinping, there has been less patience for this kind of belligerence towards China's sovereignty. So they've really put more pressure on China. And recently we've seen an unprecedented number of warplanes buzzing around Taiwanese airspace to intimidate Taipei. Chinese nationalists have been whipped up online. They're calling for a takeover. And, and even China's military is beefing up its invasion capabilities. China's military has sent fighter jets over the Taiwan Strait in an unusually large show of force. A unit of the Chinese People's Liberation Army has held combat exercises in the region, Taiwan's defense ministry saying two bombers and 16 fighter jets crossed into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Taiwan scrambled jets in response and monitored the movements of the Chinese planes.
This is scary stuff that matters to America because the U.S. has been ambiguous about whether it would come to Taiwan's defense, but there is an expectation that the U.S. will fight for Taiwan because if China were to take Taiwan, that then we enter a new era where the U.S. is no longer a military power in Asia. And for the activists like Daniel who have made a new life for themselves there, how do they feel about this imminent danger? Well, leaving Hong Kong for Taiwan can feel like you're landing just like in another place on, on borrowed time. There's definitely a sense of unease as China grows more aggressive. But these guys are also skeptical. Daniel's skeptical about Beijing's resolve to actually take Taiwan by force. And they see this as sort of like posturing to look tough for a domestic audience. He's resigned to living a long life in Taiwan, and he, he just wants to make it the best that he can. He's been studying Taiwanese history, Taiwanese culture, and he's trying to assimilate into the place. If you move to other places, you are not only a Hong Kongers. You move to Taiwan. If you decide to stay here, you need to become one of them, become one of a Taiwaner, not just Hong Kongers. You have two characters, not just one. Daniel says he's run away once already, and he's not going to run away again. I escaped once. I ran away from my war once, and I won't run away for the second time. So if, if that moment comes, I will stand up and fight again. Not just only for Hong Kong, for freedom. David, for most folks outside of Asia or people who don't pay attention to Asia, the aggression that China shows towards Hong Kong and Taiwan can be perplexing. There's such, relatively speaking, tiny blips compared to China. And yeah, they might be economic powerhouses, but they're small. So why is Hong Kong and Taiwan so important for China's vision of its global future? Well, China sees itself as a rising superpower. And Hong Kong and Taiwan are challenges to China's sovereignty. This is a red line for Beijing. President Xi Jinping had kind of hitching his legacy to this idea of unification. And he's whipping up nationalism, and that's very, very hard to dial down. So there has to be an off-ramp, otherwise tension or conflict could arise in the near future. When you look at Hong Kong, you have to think of it as the real first test case of this Chinese expansionism, right? This is like the first time we've ever seen a free society so integrated into the global economy, just absorbed by authoritarian government overnight the way that it has. And so this is an experiment. Everyone's going to be watching to see what happens next. Thank you so much for this interview, David. Thank you so much for having me. And that's it for this episode of The Times, daily news from the LA Times. Tomorrow, part two of our mini-series marking the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. We turn to China and the CCP's rewriting of its history and the people pushing back. Our show is produced by Shannon Lin, Stephen A. Cuevas, and Denise Guerra. Our executive producer is Abby Fentress Swanson. Our engineer is Mario Diaz. Our editor is Shawnee Hilton, our intern is Ashley Brown, and our theme music is by Andrew Ipe. I'm Gustavo Ariano. We'll be back tomorrow with all the news and this madre. Gracias. <laughs>